Well, I'm Justin Sabo with Digital Dream Labs, and we are a spin-off of a company that started here actually at the ETC. So what I wanted to present to you today was Puzzlets, your bare brain. And Puzzlets is the name of the product that we developed. And again, it's a stark contrast to what we just saw because this is a very consumer focused product. So it's a very, um, you know, very friendly price point, And again, it's supposed to be something that can be put into every home in America. All right, so you got, um, now I'm just gonna watch this video. Yeah, jump over things and, and when you walk to the puzzle piece and getting to the next level was really fun because you're like, yay, I accomplished it. Alex is thinking like a programmer because of puzzles. Puzzlets, when placed on the electronic play tray, allow boys and girls ages six and up to build fun programs and then play through those programs at Cork the Volcano programming software. While the programming software is running, the play tray automatically connects to your tablet or computer. Your goal in each level is to get to the puzzle piece. It looks like I should go to the right, jump over the flame, and then go to the left. So let's try that. To test my idea, I'm going to program on the play tray with my puzzlets. Each puzzlet represents a different action in the game, and the order of the puzzlets is very important. Now I'm going to play through my solution by timing each tap to execute the next action I program with puzzlets. Tap to go right, tap to jump, then tap to go left. There are five additional challenges per level. Seems engaged in it, so that's always good, as opposed to when she's on a little, uh, her phone and just like, not doing anything else except this thing in front of her face. <laughs> She's like actually using game pieces. It just seems more engaging. What I found really compelling recognize this guy? is how they're yeah. meshing both the digital and the physical experience. So you get a building block type experience combined with classic platforming, at least in the first game. And one of the immediate things I started thinking about is like you could make music, just the potential of what else you could do just with the platform they've already developed. And that, to me, is something I haven't seen before. With Puzzlets, children are introduced to programming at an earlier age, giving them a head start. Cooperate, socialize, and bond when playing Puzzlets together. Children learn better when both their minds and bodies are engaged. As the game gets more challenging, they're constantly thinking and rearranging their Puzzlets. It's wonderful seeing a child light up with their own creative solution to a really tricky level. The Puzzlet Starter Set comes with everything you need, including 22 programming puzzlets, Cork the Volcano programming software for both your tablet or computer, the rechargeable play tray, which is used for all games, and the USB cable, used for charging your play tray or connecting to your computer. With Puzzlets, your children will build a path to tomorrow's best jobs and have a lot of fun today. So it's actually not available right now, but um, that is, uh, it was available and then we actually had to stop selling it um, to gear up for our official launch, which is in September of this year. Uh, but for those of you who are just joining us, this is going to be a more product focused talk, product design, so just so everyone's aware of that. Uh, but the basic idea, what we were trying to do with this experience was to take something that's complex, that you know, requires a lot of syntax, a lot of thought, a lot of research, a lot of trial and error, and then make it very simple. So it's like taking a very, very big block of code and then putting that into just a single block that a child could actually play with. Now the most important point in all of this is actually the team itself. Um, this is a big thing at the ETC, it's really focusing on the team and kind of quick iterations. But for us, um, we had sort of the um, great idea that we were gonna make a company that focuses both on hardware and software at the same time. So it wasn't just a companion app for a piece of hardware or a piece of software that had a little piece of hardware to go with it. We actually wanted to make them very um, succinct, you know, very, very connected. So having uh, that in mind, we had to gather a really good team of artists and programmers and sales people for the retail, um, as well as fundraising for the business side of it, and then of course the design. So when we were thinking about this idea and we realized that, you know, it, it was something that 
as we described it to people, we weren't able to say very simply. It was something that, you know, we'd go, okay, well, it's kind of like this, but it's kind of like that, and it fits into this category and this category. It's kind of educational. It's kind of a video game. Um, it's a platform, though, so you can do other things with it. And what we realized, and we sort of researched this out a little bit more, um, even the gentleman who started PayPal had noted that if you have an idea that's very hard to describe at first, you might actually be onto something. And that was something for us that with the you know, transformational, uh, transformational games and media that we thought, okay, well, maybe this is something that is a little bit different. It's a little bit out there. Um, and because it's hard to explain, we might be onto something and we wanted to kind of focus on how we could um, best implement the idea of kind of this uh, hands-on uh, learning solution for kids um, that was engaging and offered, you know, again, an interesting play pattern for them again and again. But to go along with that, um, the actual product itself that we had to keep um, a lot of you know, design through subtraction. So we had to take a lot of what we were doing in this and continue to cut out things like bells, whistles, I mean, lights, sounds, all these other things that not only um, increase the cost, but they also increase the complexity of the experience. We wanted to kind of focus on one thing. Um, and the one thing was really taking the idea that we had uh, these, these little learning blocks and we could put them together in different ways on this play tray and then play through that in the video game. Then kids could learn, okay, well, maybe that wasn't correct, so I'm gonna do something else. I'm gonna go back, try it again. And that was something that we had to work really hard on. Um, it was actually the hardest thing that we had to do with this design was to make it simple. Um, it's actually very easy to make something complex. So that's something that we learned. Uh, we learned that at DTC, but of course, even in the real world, um, trying to make a consumer grade product that fits that description is also very tough because you have to worry about things like um, hardware design, prices, and um, creating things and where you're gonna do it if you know, you're creating, manufacturing it in China or the United States and all those considerations. So, Getting back to the title of the talk, uh, what, we, what we were sort of the aha moment that we, we figured out as we were designing this product was the fact that we had this kind of cross section of the brain. Um, now this product came out of a joint collaboration between the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh and between DTC uh, through one of the semesters of work. And as it was being developed, you know, it was great for a museum space, it was very social, um, it had these giant puzzle pieces, it had sort of a digital world that kids could interact with but it was very expensive and of course the museum market is also very small. So we were trying to think, well how can we reach the most amount of kids in, in a very effective way? And as we were going through it, we realized that you know, the power of the experience was really the idea that kids can actually think you know, in real time and they can put their thoughts down and their thoughts are represented by the pieces themselves. Um, so it's very easy for a kid to help another kid or a parent to help their own child when they're looking at this uh, with, they're looking at this experience and they're going, well, are you sure you wanted to jump there? Or maybe you wanted to do this or maybe you wanted to change into a different animal here. And it's very easy for them to help one another. And um, we had a lot of experiences where men, um, men who, uh, you know, grandfathers um, or grandmothers or um, parents, you know, whether or not they were really into video games could actually come up and play with the experience, which is great for us because that showed us it was more universal. And this was a term that is probably not familiar to anyone called 50-50 play. Uh, we actually use it more internally at this point, um, sort of starting to test now to see if it kind of resonates outside of the office. Um, but the 50-50 play is the idea that we're actually doing something that is 50% in the real world and 50% in the digital world. And for us, that was really important. Um, a lot of times we, we were looking at a lot of other products that we thought, you know, again, it, it was like 90% of it was on the game and then 10% of it was in the real world or the, um, a lot of you have seen the iPads that act as virtual controllers for RC cars or helicopters, which is fine, but again, it didn't really offer to us a very compelling reason to buy um, the hardware. I, I might have already owned something like that when I was a kid. So it was something that we wanted to give people a brand new type of experience. And by creating the 50-50 play, um, what we were sort of realizing as we were developing it was kids were not just sucked into the game, they were coming back out into the real world and then interacting with something in real time. Um, you could argue, of course, fine motor skills, sure. But what parents really liked about that was that parents could see that, you know, this kid is now, now I can actually talk to him and we can maybe work together. Um, but they're not just uh, sort of on the screen and then nothing is going on in the peripheral. Um, now they were actually back and, and kind of talking with us. Um, so this is something that even families, um, we sold a few of these units to families and they've played them in their house, you know, sort of a, a dinner table after dinner, they would all sit around and play it together, which is great. Um, the first time we had really heard of, of parents really getting into a video game um, that was closer to, let's say, a Super Mario Brothers type experience, 
where at the same time they felt you know this was something that they could actually master um, and it wasn't so intimidating to them because as we all know today many video games are very complex and intimidating uh, especially for the older generation so this is a way to um, get them involved as well and the second point um, was you know the I know stem is kind of 2014 and steam is the new 2015 word, um, but the idea that kids are now creators, they're, they're not just consuming this content, um, this is a big thing now with Steam, I think it's really giving kids the tools to learn how to learn so that they can make their own things. And that was something that we felt was really important to us as we developed the product, was giving kids the, the idea that with any games that we create, any experiences, you can take and you can kind of make your own solutions to these puzzles or these problems. Um, and that idea for us was really powerful because as kids, you know, our favorite games usually had a lot of that. If uh, I knew Jesse had to leave, but he, um, when we were at the ETC, a meaningful choice was a big thing that he always talked about, which is the idea that kids, you know, need to be doing something that they, you know, can see, well, I can do A, B, or C, and which one should I do and why should I do that one and which one's better and, and weighing your options. And we wanted kids to explore that, um, again, in a very fun and safe environment. And that's where the video game portion really shines through because it allows them to be creative, but also, again, take away some skills, like in this case, logic and sequencing, where they're putting together their blocks in a certain order. Um, the third point, and I know I touched on this before, was the accessibility. Um, we didn't want something that was, um, now you saw in the team photo, the other reason I put that up there, you'll notice that was all men. Um, one of the big things with, especially the STEAM movement, is getting girls involved at an earlier age, too. And that was one thing that we were really um, passionate about when we were designing our product, um, not just the design of the physical product, but actually the game and the characters and the world, um, that it felt very gender neutral, so that girls were engaging just, whoops, girls were engaging just as much as boys were. Um, and that was something that we thought, um, you know, at first, okay, we, we could see how that goes. We're not really sure because, again, we're all guys and maybe we're not going to think about this right. And the feedback we kept getting was girls were just as engaged with, with the product as, as the guys were. Um, these are a pair of brother and sister, and they, this is not posed or anything. They, um, they played this for about 10 minutes at one of the CMU events and uh, were obviously very engaged. And their parents actually sent me a photograph um, of each of them saying th you know, thank you and a picture that they each drew of a level that they designed for the game. Like they drew it with crayons and they sent it in to me. <laughs> so we had that hanging in our office. Um, and it was things like that that really got us thinking this is a product that's really, um, really able to kind of go uh, the extra mile and it, get, get, it has people thinking about it even when they're not playing it. And the togetherness aspect, again, that, that cooperative, um, you'll see a lot of these photos, it's just more, it's more than one person playing at the same time. Um, we really like that because um, in game design we would call this asymmetric gameplay. So we have the sort of real world tiles with the, the puzzlets and I put them down and then I have the virtual, the virtual video game screen. And so it's great because two people can play it together and actually enjoy the experience cooperatively. Um, a lot of times when you talk about multiplayer games today, a lot of them are, are bloody and you're shooting each other and that's, you know, whoever kills the most people wins. Um, and that was something that for us, you know, I, I remember my best memories of video games were back in Nintendo 64, right? And you were playing like Mario Kart. And yeah, you're competing, but you're all in the same room playing with your friends and that's really cool. And a lot of um, experiences today don't really offer that local uh, play, let's iOS, Android, uh, Mac, or PC. Usually, that's that's reserved more for the consoles. And we thought, well, this really provides a great experience for two people to play together asymmetrically. Um, and what we found too is that um, the product itself, we were designing it more for six and up, and that's just because as and again, I will fully admit I am not an educator by, um, by definition and, and, and by training, but we did find that kids that were about four or five could play, but cognitively they were all very different. They were very scattered, so we didn't know exactly where they would fall. Um, but to address that, we found that playing them, having them play together um, on the same, you know, the same, in the same um, workspace, they actually were able to play it and get through even the first world. And these were kids that were five years old. And that was really compelling for us because that was something that we didn't even think was possible. Um, and again, it's really just because they had, um, they had the two kids and you're, you're kind of learning from each other and you're pointing out things from each other that, hey, why don't we try this? Or, hey, you need to tap quicker here. Or, hey, we need to switch up this block. And again, that was just really cool to see. And the teachers at O'Hara Elementary, where we did a kindergarten play test, and we had about, I think, 20, I want to say 20 kindergartners, 25 kindergartners, and they were in pairs. The teachers remarked how they weren't fighting over, you know, oh, I get to do the blocks now, and then I get to play the game, or they were actually cooperating and, and respecting one another. And that was something that they remarked they hadn't really seen before in products. Um, and then this is the other point, and I sort of brushed on this before with the 
you know, the idea of the museum exhibit, now we wanted to make something that's actually affordable for the masses. Um, and this is, believe it or not, probably one of the biggest challenges of doing a product like this, is because if you look at any product on the shelf, um, the rule is you kind of divide it by four, and that's how much you have to produce it for at cost. So if it's a $100 product like ours, the goal is, okay, let's, can we get it to $25? And if we can get it to $25, then we can you know, have our salespeople take commission and then sell it up from there, and then it's in the store for the consumer to buy for $99. So, that's, and, and that was another consideration in terms of what key features, you know, we wanted to make this great experience, this 50-50 play, but what was probably, and, and what it turned out to be, is what is the one thing that we could do well and have that be the key feature of, of the experience? And for us, it was really the speed at which the board reads all of the little pockets and then sends it into the game and how quickly that can happen. And that was kind of our guiding light. Um, and we looked at other products too, and we thought, well, you know, if we, because of course the, the first thought would be, well, you, you know, you could have a screen built in maybe to the tray and that, that could work, but that just um, skyrockets the cost. It also limits what types of experiences you can have. So to make it affordable, it was, okay, well, let's, you know, divorce the screen from, um, from the actual um, play tray itself. And by doing that, then it's now compatible with phones, it's compatible with tablets or Macs or PCs, and you can take advantage of the hardware that already exists. And people are, Fine. Yeah, a lot of people um, give their kids their uh, old iPads anyway, so it's just a great way to kind of reutilize them, but again in a way that parents felt this is more educational, this is a little, a little bit more uh, meaningful than just a pure entertainment product. And just as a disclaimer, I love Super Mario and Nintendo, so I, I, I love entertainment stuff. So just that parents at that age were a little bit more hesitant because they felt that the screen time was, um, as kids were exposed to more screens, they were just sort of getting sucked into the screens more and more and more. So they wanted something to kind of pull them back a little bit. And within the game itself and the experience, um, it was really, uh, we wanted to have a long-term type uh, involvement. So it wasn't just there are a couple levels or maybe there are a couple little games and then you go through it. Um, we really wanted something that felt like a cohesive experience. So we created in our, our first software, Cork the Volcano, for programming, um, Pear Island, and that's where the whole game takes place and we have different worlds, again, similar to classic platformers that are themed. Because we wanted to make sure that the experience itself when kids weren't playing it, they were still kind of thinking about it. Or um, they, you know, they have their little sticker set with the characters on it and they're putting them on their play tray or on their lunch boxes or whatever they want. Um, but when we were, as we were developing it, um, you know, people were saying, well, instead of just having just a quick, you know, maybe you go through it and maybe it's more of an arcade experience, they wanted a deeper sort of richer um, play pattern with their kids. Um, and the fascinating thing that we found out, I don't know if, has anyone played Super Mario Galaxy here? Someone? Played it. Okay, a few. So you know that the levels in there can be pretty long. Um, and what we found when we were talking to parents was the metric that they used for the value of the product wasn't the level length, it was the number of levels. So they're thinking about it maybe because you know, it's on a tablet, Angry Birds, right? There are so many Angry Birds levels, but they're very, very short. And for us, and it's me as a gamer, that was fascinating because I thought, you know, well, who cares, right? It's, it's more about how long the game is. I mean, Mario Kart 8, I love that. That's for Wii U. I play that all the time. It's not that the game itself is very long, but I play it over and over and over again. But again, parents were perceiving the value based on the number of levels. So anyway, that's a sort of a fun takeaway if you're ever designing something. Speak in terms of levels, because I love that stuff. Um, but again, it, it, it was interesting, because taking that idea that, okay, well, if they are perceiving levels as value, we just need to make smaller levels. So every level in our game um, doesn't scroll, it's just kind of a single screen experience. And that, was, that actually worked out quite well. Um, and then characters. So again, we wanted to make something that um, Nintendo realizes too. I was actually just watching a documentary on Atari last night, and they were talking about how when Nintendo sort of went into the entertainment space, the video game space, um, they realized that it wasn't about the blips or the little things or just nice cover art. You actually had of characters in your game that were going to be compelling, that kids were going to relate to, that they were going to play as. Um, and that was something that, that we really took to heart, too. Um, we wanted to make our characters very compelling, very fun, um, and again, characters that you could maybe translate into uh, other media, too. You know, they could, they could be in other games, or they could be on t-shirts, or, or other types of um, merchandise. But basically, we wanted to make sure that they were, um, they were something that the kids were, were going to go, oh, yeah, you know, I, I like playing as Russ the Dinosaur. And, a, and again, a girl, as well as a, a guy, could, could say that. Um, but in the end, it really came down to the game itself. Um, and this is where playtesting uh, profusely took place. And we did a lot of that actually at the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh. 
uh, because of our continued relationship with them through the museum exhibit. And the focus on the game, again, was to make it as simplistic as possible, but allow a lot of emergent complexity. So kids were allowed to you know, do whatever they wanted to. We'd give them the little steps along the way, and then eventually it would click, and they'd go, oh, wait, I could do this and this and this, and I could, I could really have a, an interesting, I could beat the level much differently than you can. Um, and I don't want to go into too many game specifics, but um, the idea that the software itself was really what was keeping the kids coming back. That was the true engagement, was the software. Um, and the hardware was the thing that, again, got the social play, it got parents really hooked on it, and again, it gave kids a different way to play, uh, because I'm sure you've seen a lot of kids today, right, they'll play, they'll load up their games and they'll kind of tap through and they'll be you know, doing stuff really fast. We wanted to have an experience where kids actually had to stop and go, wait a minute, you know, hmm okay, wait, I need to do this, and then I need to move this block. And it's fun to see that, because they actually do have to slow down. The game forces them to do that. Uh, but again, because they're having fun, they're thinking, all right, well, this is just, you know, this, I'm trying to get to the puzzle piece, and, and let me do it. Um, and it's just fascinating to watch that happen, and not have them just be able to tap through and, and, and kind of do And some of them do try that, and then they fail, and then they realize they have to slow down, um, which is something that I think, um, as we go forward, I think more, more types of experiences like this um, should try to um, should try to have because if you're if you're going so quick, you might not even be realizing you're you're doing anything or, or you're really retaining anything. Um, whereas the kids now, if they're stopping and thinking, they can go back and reevaluate what their what their original thoughts were and maybe why they were wrong or right. Um, and the last point to make is the multi-trick pony. So again, it wasn't just a single idea, um, and this was something that we, we did fall victim to when we first started, which was making a product that was a single experience. Um, and that's not really good. Um, the single experience, as we found, could be good for that one thing, but if somebody doesn't like that one thing, you've kind of failed as a product designer. Um, so we wanted to make a platform. So this example is just our next game coming out, and it's about chemistry. So when we were developing our first product, we were asking parents, you know, what, what would you like, what would you like to see? And chemistry always came up again and again as, hey, if you do that, you know, I, I, would definitely, I would definitely love to check that out. I'd love to buy that, uh, the chemistry game for my kid, because again, they'll be able to learn about it at an earlier age. So that was the other big, the big takeaway too, that you know, we, because we were all going through all of this for the first time, making a video game, making a piece of hardware, and that was something that was really challenging for us, was trying to think about it. Um, but again, getting it to that simplistic physical design allowed us to then do a lot of things in a lot of different directions. Um, there's also possibilities here for special education, which we've tested on, therapeutic use, um, the elderly, even preschool, you know, zero to three years old. Um, so there's a lot of directions that we can go with now with the product because we made it so simple. Um, but again, it, it did take a lot of, uh, a lot of testing and a lot of um, hardware design considerations to, to actually get to that point. Um, and this is just kind of a, a thought. Um, this is uh, by Neil deGrasse Tyson. And you know, when I was a kid, the thing I really loved most was when we got to make stuff. I remember second grade, we got to make dioramas, and that was really fun. And I loved doing things in groups, but it wasn't actually until ETC that I got to do that again, because so much of education is we're sitting down in classrooms, taking notes, and I, I personally never really got the hang of that one. Um, but you know, as he points out, right, there's something wrong with the way that we're doing things now. Um, and I think that the active play really helps, um, and it's really helped us with our product, because kids are now just not, you know, they're not just sitting there taking notes or they're not recalling, but they're actually using more than one sense to, to learn and to engage with not just the subject matter, but also with each other. <coughs> so I just wanted to thank you for your time, and I think we have five minutes or less. Um, so are there any questions? I know lunch is about to happen. Have you thought of using this uh, to teach music synthesis? Um, we actually, so we, we have a, um, a prototype of the blocks as music notes that you can use the board as. Um, but we're not musicians, so we haven't, <laughs> we haven't really gone down that road yet. Um, but if that's something that you'd like to talk about afterwards, let me yeah, know. Yeah, sure. Um, you mentioned the kids showing you pictures of levels that they wanted. Um, is there a plan for a level designer for the kids to use or anything like that? There could be. Um, so it's funny, because right now we're using Unity to develop all of our um, all of our stuff, and we'd almost have to make a unity within unity for kids to be able to do that. Um, but right now, uh, because we're such a small team, we're focusing more on just outputting additional games and then level, <coughs> level packs for the games. Uh, but that is something that is probably the most requested um, feature by educators, more so than parents, would be the level. So it is something we're considering, but we do need to wait until we grow as a team to be able to do that. 
Yeah. Um, so I understand like the 50-50 of you know taking this physical thing, um, but even the physical thing feels pretty much like it could easily be digital and not lose a lot from that. So mm -hmm. for instance, if there was, you swipe the screen over and then you see the puzzlets on the screen and you do your thing and you swipe it back and then you see it, uh, the interaction that might occur from that. Mm -hmm. And I know you guys must have spent a lot of time talking about that like division between what's physical and what's digital because mm -hmm. it seems like the you know the, the cost to market and the audience you could reach would be phenomenally larger if it was a pure iPad app that you could just get from the store without having to go pick up a physical piece of hardware and you could still have the same learning um, maybe not quite as robust um, you know but it would still all be there the basic premise of that would be and I'm just curious of how you kind of balance off that trade-off sure well I guess to, to, be, to best address it, think about that as what you would do after you would use the physical hardware as a young kid. So then you could graduate from doing the hands-on to more of just a, a, um, a software play. Um, but when we, when we were, um, again, when we were kind of developing it, we realized, and parents were telling us, you know, they, they didn't want their kids just on the iPad as much. They wanted to kind of bring them back. Um, and they also wanted something where, and from a design perspective, it's nice because everything that you need, let's um, look back. So everything you need is right out in front of you at all times. Um, there aren't, there's nothing you have to swipe or anything you have to do. Um, your board, your pieces, and your problem are all right there. And that for us was something that, um, because again, we actually did start off as more just software. Uh, but then we found that it was actually more compelling, more engaging, um, and more accessible when we did have that separate hardware piece. And again, it does open up the socialization aspect that you do lose if you, if you don't have that. Um, so you mentioned you have the um, expansion for another set of the puzzle mm -hmm. Um I wonder, can that be used combining with or you know pieces you have already developed, you know, for a specific game, or it's the packs are more like uh, game specific? Yeah. So the games themselves, um, the programming game has its own little programming puzzle. It's going to go up, go down, left, right, jump. Yeah. Um, then this pack, for example, the chemistry pack would have atoms, so it would be very different because the way the puzzle pieces fit together is also different um, because it does have that physical affordance where atoms can fit together differently than, than a sequence of blocks. Um, but the idea is as you're developing, um, as, we're, sorry, as we're developing more of the expansion software, you can make level packs or advanced software that uses the same blocks, let's say for the chemistry game, but it would be chemistry 2.0, maybe using the same chemistry blocks. That's kind of the idea doesn't rule out this, the idea for a generic set, but the other, um, just introducing a product like this to market too is very challenging. So having a lot of the, um, ha having it be almost too open or too generic was actually working against us. Um, when we first started talking about the product and you know there could be an SDK and you can make your own game, people got very confused. Like, well, what can it do for me right now? Um, and that's why we had to focus more on just the, the one you know, programming or chemistry and then people, people got it. Um, but as, we, as it becomes more mainstream, then the hope is we can then introduce more generic type pieces. Just was curious if you could describe like the gameplay. Like it's easy to understand the dinosaur going through the maze and getting the puzzle piece. Because mm -hmm. that's just a very t easy to understand. Like here's a goal, run this guy, left sure. up down. Um, but with a um, chemistry teaching game, like what's the idea there? Yeah, so, so the, the basic idea, um, and I don't want to talk too much about the gameplay because we haven't really announced anything yet, um, but the basic idea is you have your chemistry atoms and you put them down on the play tray. Let's say you put H-O-H -H, and that gets sent into the game and then you bond them together and now you've created the molecule of water and then use the water molecule to solve something in the video game itself. Um, so then kids are learning about actual bonds, you know, nitrogen or di dinitrogen, it's dinitrogen oxide. All the different types of chemical formulas, they're triple bonds, single bonds, double bonds. Um, and that was kind of our, our sort of original idea was just being able to put the atoms down and then, and then combine them. And then within the game, those atoms will have, or sorry, the molecules will have special properties that you'll use to solve problems. Um, but that experience will be more of a, right now this is, you know, call it more of a, you know, get to the goal. Um, that'll be more of an exploratory type game. about time. I think it's about lunch, so. Yeah, let's go to lunch. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you.